Good morning. This is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project, and this is November 13, 2000. This morning we are pleased to have with us Virginia Scammon. Virginia, how are you today? Fine, thank you. You look great. Thank you. Um, may I ask how old you are? I'm 78. 78 years old, and what is your current address in, here in Natick? Yes. Okay. And your current mar marital status? Divorced. Divorced. Do you have any children? Four children. And how about grandchildren? Six. 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 And about how, how old are they? Well, the oldest one will be 30 next April. The youngest one is 11. That's quite a family. Yeah. That's great. Uh -huh. That's very good. Where were you born, Virginia? Litchfield, Kentucky. Litchfield, Kentucky. And were you raised there? Yes. Can you tell us about your family? What did your dad do? Oh, uh, we were farmers, farmers. And uh, I just had one brother, and he's been dead for several years. That's and what did you, how about your mom? What did she do? She was just Took a housewife. Took care of the family? Yeah. Yeah, tell me about farming in Kentucky <laughs> back then. I can tell you how it was back then, and it's changed a lot, I know. Yeah. Um, we used horses, horses, and uh, you know, not uh, no tractors or no mechanical stuff. It was all pulled by horses, the machinery, and we raised a lot of crops, raised corn, tobacco, wheat, and vegetables, and uh, then we raised cattle beef cattle, and I, we had a dairy cow for our own use, and we had pigs and sheep, and we had horses. How big a place was this? How many acres? Uh, it was big. <laughs> 350 acres. That's almost a section of land. Yeah, but it took that much to make a living on, you see. And Litch Litchfield is where in the state of Kentucky? Central, east, west, north, south? Well, my county borders on the Ohio River, and it's west of Louisville. Okay. And how long did you live at this place? I uh, lived there until I was, uh, well, 18, and then I went away to college for two years. And then I came back and taught school one year. And then I, lived, I went away to the Navy and when I was 21. You went to college for two years. Uh, what did you learn there? That is, what did you major in? Home economics. Home economics. And then you came back to Litchfield to teach school. And what did you teach home economics? No. Taught uh, junior high, seventh and eighth grade. Okay. And you got out of college about what year? Uh, of 40. I went at 40 and I started teaching school in uh, 42 in the fall. I went two years to college, so I got out in 42. Okay, so during that time, uh, America entered the war. Mm -hmm. um, where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was in the dormitory at school at college, and it came over the radio. I didn't have a radio in my room, but somebody came and told me. That was when uh, Japan, when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Yes. That's what I'm talking about now. Yeah. You said a moment ago you had a brother. Yeah. Uh, was, was he in the service? Yeah. Uh, what service was he in? He was in the Navy. He was. Mm -hmm. Is this what kind of made you think you might go into the Navy? What? Did you think then that you might go into the Navy? I went in before he did. Oh, you did? He was younger. So he followed you into the Navy? Well, I don't know if he followed me, but he went after. So in 1942, you're home and teaching. Yeah. Uh, and when did you go into the Navy? 43. 43. May, in May of 43. Tell us about that. You're a teacher. Uh, you've got a college background. What possessed you to go into the United States Navy? I didn't like teaching. <laughs> <laughs> what, 
What was wartime Kentucky like at that time? Were your neighbors going into the service? Yeah. People you went to high school with? Yeah, yeah. And what finally decided you to go, other than you didn't like teaching? I don't know. <laughs> I just, just seemed like the right thing to do, you know? Many reasons, actually. One of them, I guess, was to help out, but uh, I just thought it'd be something I would never do again. I never had a chance to do anything mm -hmm. like that again. And just the excitement of being in the, in the middle of it. <laughs> this was pretty early in the war for the United States. Um, mm -hmm. It was uh, at a time when um, I don't think we had had many victories at that time. No, 40, 43. No, we hadn't. Guadalcanal was uh, six oh, yeah. months later. Yeah, uh, so war was at its height then. Yeah. All right, tell us about joining the Navy. Did you go into a uh, recruiting office somewhere? Yeah. I, got, I went into the recruiting office and I got a, no, I went to the post office and got a pamphlet on the waves and I read it and I liked, I liked what it said. Did you consider any other branch of service? No, I don't think I did. I knew right that's what I wanted to do. What is it about the waves that attracted you? Well, the let's pamphlet see. must have really been a good <laughs> one. What sold you on the Navy? You know, I, I never did think about that. Um, I, I can't say. One I, of the things the Navy promises uh, in all the brochures yeah, I've looked at are, just, is travel. They that just you're sounded get to travel. good. You know, they sounded good. I don't know in what way, but uh, I, 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 that's, I wish I'd have thought about that before to think more about that's it. That's okay. But uh, they just seem like a, a good group to be in. Mm -hmm that they would be fair to you and give you opportunities when they arose and give you a chance to get ahead and to do something interesting. Did you say you were 21 years old at that time? Did you think maybe that um, the Navy would offer more education for you? I know, uh, I never no. thought about the education part. Okay, so you're in a post office in Litchfield, Kentucky, well, yeah. you're reading this pamphlet and you say, this is for me. What did you do then? Well, uh, the nearest recruiting office was in Owensboro. That's where the recruiters were. And uh, somehow I got in contact with them. And they came up there. They were, they were trying to get enlistees. And especially they wanted, way, they wanted women to get in, and uh, they came up there and talked to me, and that kind of solidified my, what I wanted to do more, and uh, then I went down to the, down to their office in Owensboro. You know, they didn't have offices in every place, that, that was the nearest one. How far was that from Litchfield? Uh, well, um, maybe. 30 miles, mm -hmm. something like that. But they were very interested in you. Oh yeah, they, they had me to get on the radio and talk and all that. Oh really? Uh, to talk about being in the yeah, Navy? Yeah, yeah. When the recruiter came to speak with you, did he narrow down those areas that you might enlist in, in the functions you would perform? I don't remember that. He explained a lot. Or any question I had, I asked him, and he would explain it, but I don't remember specifics. This is several years ago. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but they were really nice, and, you know, like we would say in the Navy, they were eager to get uh, me in. And uh, we went with, uh, I went with one of them over to another girl's house that I knew, and she enlisted too. So I did. This is a friend of yours? Yeah, oh, good. yeah, yeah. Good. She it's was in the neighborhood, yeah. And so what happened then? Did you go to Owensboro to enlist? 
Actually, <coughs> actually, they sent me to Cincinnati. That was the nearest uh, place that you could. In, that's the nearest place you could go to to be sworn in and get your final test. You know, you had to get uh, you had to get a preliminary physical, and then you get up there. They have people examine you more, mm -hmm. and then you can be sworn in right there. Now, did you enlist for any particular number of years, or just for the duration, or what? Just for the duration. Duration of the war. You and your friend? No, she didn't go with me. Okay. She did it later. Was uh, anybody else with you that you knew? You were all on your own in Cincinnati. Yeah, they sent me the bus fare ticket to get up there. And from Cincinnati, did you go back home, or did you go? No, I went back home. And then they, you waited for them to call you. Mm -hmm. They called you, and where did you go? Went to Hunter College in New York. And what about saying goodbye to your family, your mom and dad and your younger brother? Uh, they, they knew I was going, and they, were, they didn't try to stop me. They were all, all, you know, they agreed with me that it was all right, if it's what I wanted to do. Had you ever been away from home before? Just at school. Yeah. College. So now all of a sudden you're in wild New York. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about going to Hunter College. Did you go on a train? <clears throat> yeah, went on a train. And, was, and you knew, didn't know anybody else. How'd you feel about that? I was, I was excited about it. I thought that was a big adventure, you know? Well, it was. Yeah. It was. I wasn't afraid or apprehensive or anything okay. like that. Tell us about arriving at Hunter College. Well, went to Grand Central Station. Well, that was pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> That's impressive right there. <laughs> and I happened to meet up with some other wave. So we, uh, I don't know how we got out to Hunter College, but we did. <laughs> Maybe on, on the subway or a bus, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't remember how we got there, but we got there. That was in the Bronx, that Hunter College was. And they just, like the Navy, took the whole thing over, you know, that college, like they used to do. When they wanted something, they took it. <laughs> okay, now you, you mentioned taking tests. Uh, tell us about the tests that you took. Oh boy, they were all kinds written tests and physical tests, and then they give you all those shots. <laughs> and your arms get sore, and uh, you, you, you just, you'd have to drill and go to classes. They have classes, and uh, like, I don't know the name of the classes, like naval history and all about about ships so they just tried to give you an overall picture of what the navy what the waves were and then then you can they gave you papers to fill out which was your they explained different things that you could do and you could list your preferences one two three and uh, so what i got was my third choice what, what were the choices? Can you remember one, two, oh, and three? Oh, there was a whole lot. I put down hospital corpsmen's what I wanted first, and then uh, link train, I don't know. Control tower operator was my second choice. You know, I never heard of that, but that's what I, they explained it. And then link trainer instructor, that's what I got. How about your, your own specific two years of college? Uh, did they take that into account that you were educated in a particular field? Yeah, I think uh, the, just the two years, it was, it was a teacher's college, and I think that's how, was one thing that I got into being an instructor, because I had had that much. What did you know prior to going to Hunter College about a link trainer? Did you Nothing. know what it was? No. I and didn't know anything about it. Then where did you know enough to put it, make it number third choice? They explained all the different things that you could do. And you could, you know, quite, quite in detail so that you would know what you were choosing, but that didn't mean you got what you chose, you right. know. They put you where they needed you is what they did based on their experience and their, what they needed. 
so it was that at the end of your time at Hunter College? Well, just one month. That's very months. intensive, you know. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And then, uh, then they shipped some of us to uh, the ones that were going to be link trainers and instructors. We were shipped to Atlanta all together as a group. And uh, that's where we stayed for three months. And uh, that's where we learned what we were going to do. Oh, did you remember? Do you remember what facility? Were you, where were you in the Atlanta area? Yeah, it was a naval air station. It was outside the city. It wasn't in the city. They had uh, two two things there. They had us, which they called us Lidus, and then Ephus was the um, officers who were going to be flight instructors. They had two separate branches there on the base. Were, was your unit all women? Yes. There were no men being trained no. as link trainers? No. Okay. Link trainer instructors, excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Okay, tell us about your training. <laughs> okay. Most people don't know what the link trainers are, and I didn't either, but they are simulators basically simulate flight some of the instruments in them are instruments that are actually in the plane and other things are just simulated uh, you have a you sit in a cockpit and you're covered over like it's like a toy it's almost as big as some of them little planes actually but uh, you're in there and you're, you're all covered over and you can't see out and you have a your teacher is sitting out here at a desk. That's you. Well, when I was been training, it was the, my who was training me. See, I was in the cockpit. Okay, and because uh, we had to do what what the cadets would have to do when we were teaching them, and they would sit out there and they have on the desk uh, a machine that traces. It's connected up to this simulator that traces your flight path on an actual actual airport airfield you know you mm -hmm. get the sound that get the signals that you would get if you were flying around an airport an a and n <laughs> and uh, you What's talk a, what is a and n it's just a signal on each side of a beam tells you which side you're on and you talk and you have talk between the student and the teacher and the teacher tells you what to do and it's what you do in that simulator is traced out on the piece of paper and they can tell whether you're doing what you're supposed to or not. So you are actually learning to fly Yeah. before you were learning how to teach other people to oh, fly. Yeah. Well, you can't teach something unless you know what to do yourself. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, I was quite, uh, I thought I was pretty lucky to get into that. Because some of the waves, you know, they got sent to an office and sit there and the whole time. But uh, then after we were in, well, I was getting ahead of myself, but uh, they took us up in a plane so we could see what it was like, you know, get the feel of it. Tell us, can you remember... Uh, this is so interesting. Can you remember the first time you sat in that thing and they pulled the hood up <laughs> and you get every, the whole world comes through your headset and you're looking at instruments there and what did they what did they do then? What did they tell you? What did they tell me? Yeah. How does how did the process work? Somebody said, "All right, you're about to take off." Or No, we we would be like we didn't learn about taking off and landing. We learned how to fly by instruments after we got in the air. Well, they have orientation things. You had to orient, like if you were in the, up in the, up in the, the sky in a plane and you didn't know where you were, you had to orient yourself. They had certain procedures. You know, the, the really it was, it was detailed. I mean, it was specific. It was not something everybody would learn. But <clears throat> you could orient yourself. There are certain procedures you could fly out on a 
beam, and you get you were getting the radio signal all the time. This operator here at the desk was giving you with her instruments, was giving you the signal that you would get if you were actually in the air. Mm -hmm. And you had to orient yourself and find out where you were and come back. See, the beam, the sound would get louder as you went away from the airport and get, no, it would get louder as you come in and get dimmer as you went out. So you turn, make certain turns, find out where you were. How many of you were doing this all at the same time? How many were in your group? Hmm. I don't know. Um, in Atlanta, there was um, there was one barracks all full, and that's all that was in there. Uh, I wouldn't know. I can't say definitely. Maybe. Maybe 50. And uh, we were all learning the same thing. And, and this is about um, getting down into the end of 1942, is that correct? 43. 43, excuse me. So you were listening to the war news at the same time and... We weren't listening to much of anything except what we were learning. What, what were your hours? It, Eight in the morning till seven at night, something like that. No, not that no. long. <laughs> they didn't give us that long. Uh, maybe eight in the morning till maybe four or five, I guess. Mm -hmm. Regular work day. And did you have book work after that? Did yeah, you have lectures yeah, we and had things books. like that? So, how long a, a commitment was this that you were being trained there at three Atlanta? months? Three months. So at where are we in 43 now? Well, in the fall. The fall of 43. Yeah. And we had classes, too. Yeah. We had other classes. We weren't doing that all the time. We were supposed to learn the Morse code. <laughs> I didn't do too well on that. But uh, we had classes. And after three months, and they agreed that you could do this pretty well. Did you then sit at that table and talk to a student inside uh, yeah. a couple of times to yeah. know that you... Oh, oh, yeah. And did you feel that you were very well trained and the uh, Navy yeah. had done its job? Yeah, I thought I knew what I was doing. They wouldn't let you out of there until you did, until they felt you did, no. Did the... Navy ever sit you down and uh, talk to you about foreign places you might go to? We couldn't go foreign. We could not go overseas. Okay. At that time. Why is that? I don't know. <laughs> when you're in the Navy, you don't ask why. <laughs> you just do it. You, you said at that time. Uh, later on, did link trainer operators uh, go I don't know elsewhere? if they did or not. And what happened after you left Atlanta? Did you graduate as though from a school? Yeah, yeah. With what rank now? Well, I was a petty officer, uh, third class, when I got out of there. And automatically, if you got out of that school, you were a third class petty officer. That's pretty good for being in the Navy that short time. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's the way it was in the war. Yeah. You advanced. And where did, uh, where did you go from Atlanta? To Pensacola. And Pensacola is a very large naval air station there. Uh, did you go with as a group? Did you go by yourself or several I went others? Home. I went home for two weeks. Back to Kentucky. And then you went by yourself down to Pensacola. Tell us about going home in uniform, um, <laughs> in the very spiffy, petty officer's uniform. What, yeah. did, what did your family think about this? Well, they thought I looked good, you know. <laughs> I, that, was, that was pretty good clothes for me. You know, that uniform makes you look good, don't you think? Yes, yes. <laughs> Whether you look good or not. <laughs> uh, oh, I, went, I wanted to go everywhere and show off my uniform and myself, you know. And you had two weeks of it. Yeah. And then by yourself, you went down to... Uh, 
NAS uh, yeah. Pensacola. On the train. Yeah. Tell us about arriving there all by yourself. <laughs> you keep stressing all by myself, you know. I, I was, I never thought of that. But, uh, well, they told you where to report to, of course. And so you did. But Pensacola has got a lot of outlying fields. Still has. Every once in a while I see something about the one where I was. I was at Whiting Field, but it was Pensacola. Whiting? Field. Whiting. Yeah. It was a new field. And it specifically trained pilots. That's what they did. My squadron was Squadron 3, and that's, uh, they had a big airfield, and those cadets, they had classes, and then they had actual flight with an instructor up in a plane, then they had classes with us. And they had to get through all of that <laughs> before they could be a pilot, you know. Were you, were you put immediately to work as soon as you arrived that they really needed you? Yeah. And tell us about the facility that you worked in. Was it a big hangar or? We didn't uh, work in a hangar. We, we had a certain build, we had a, our own building that was air conditioned because it had to be because of the trainers, mm -hmm. they, their instruments to work right. And uh, it was a big, big building and there was two wings to it, two sides, you know. And uh, we had our own trainer. No, let's see, we didn't always have the same one, but you could get the same trainer if you wanted to. And uh, we had two, two shifts. One started, huh, had the morning shift or the afternoon, and it changed, but it was always in the daytime. You worked six hours. Six hours is all you worked in a day. How many students could you accommodate in six hours? How long uh, were they in the box? An hour. An hour. They gave them an hour, but of course you had to check in and all that. So they actually weren't training for a full hour, but it was an hour, scheduled for an hour. We had six students a day. And some of them would be, they would bring their sheet to us and tell us how far they were. Of, and in their training, it would tell. Each instructor, like I was, would write on their sheet what they did that day. And they had certain phases they had to go through. And we could look at that and tell where they were in their training. So we just started in the next step. And when they got through with us, they, they were through. Hopefully they learned a little bit about instrument flying, you know, without being up in the air and learning where it was more dangerous. Virginia, were you in the position of having to evaluate men who wanted to be pilots and did you see that some of them just weren't going to make it? Well, that wasn't my job to pass on them. I just, whether they could do their work with us, that was all we had to do. Their flight instructors were the ones who would mm -hmm. tell whether they would be pilots or not. But they took the work that you graded, as yeah, it were, yeah. and saw what they had done yeah. as when they worked with you. Yeah. So this was part of their training, then they'd go on to other it increments. It was, it was. Did you get to know any of these guys? Well, some of them would come back to me, you know. Uh, I guess they could ask. They would check in at the door there, and they could ask for a certain trainer if they wanted to. Some of them came back to me, yeah. I kept a log book, you know. of. They gave us the books to keep because uh, you could take this training and if there was any place you could use it, <laughs> you know, in civilian life. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't know of anybody who did, but we kept log books. Do you have any idea how many men passed through your particular station? No, I don't. Uh, do you have any idea how many men you yourself uh, six hours at a time uh, worked on during this time? It wasn't. They, did, they had an hour. Yes. But there were six students, six yes. different ones. That's how many? Yeah. 
How many did you work well, with? Well, I've got that book, but I don't know how many it was. I didn't look at it. Uh, I don't know. That's okay. How long did you do this? Until November in 44. So you went down there in 43, and then you were there until 44. And was it your duties more or less the same in all that time you were oh, there? Oh yeah, exactly the same. I advanced to Petty Officer Second Class while I was there, you know. You have to take a test and have put in the time, and they, if you pass the test and have the time in, then you automatically get the higher, the next higher rating. So I was second class, which is better than third. <laughs> you, you got a pay raise, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us about life on the base? Uh, how many women were there vis-a-vis -vis 10,000 guys or what the ratio was? I don't know the ratio. We had a barracks with just that was all that was in our barracks was us, us link trainers and some secretaries, yeoman, you know. Mm -hmm. And then there was another barracks over there that had the mechanics, the women mechanics, because they did they did train some of us for being working on the planes mechanically. Uh, and then the only other people were on that base were the cadets. And then they had some flight officers, their instructors, and of course the, the uh, well, the officers, you know, there's certain officers on every base. I forget what they call them. I don't know. But there was an officers, and you didn't mix with the, you know, the, the officers and the uh, enlisted didn't mix socially. But we had a a place down there. They call it like it was like a ship service. They call it where you could go down there and and get soft drinks and stuff and sit and talk. The men could come down there. The enlisted men. There were some enlisted men there too. I don't know what they were doing there. <laughs> well, there was another squadron came in there that had all men in it down at the other end of the field. Do you recall what kind of planes uh, these men were flying? Um, they were two-seaters. They were like fighters, I guess. They weren't bombers. They were fighters, and they were two seats in them. They let us go up in one of them and fly a little. There was a, a flight instructor in one seat, you know, one behind the other, not across. And that's uh, what they call them. They call them SNJs and SNVs, whatever that means. I don't know what it means. <laughs> but that's the type of planes they were. The SNJs are those planes that when you see a war movie and the Japanese villains are coming in to bomb the Americans or something, they're always flying an old SN SNJ. Are they? Yeah, that's what, that's what they use. Okay, that's what we had. <laughs> Were women used in any other capacity? You haven't mentioned radio operators or anything like that. Uh, you mentioned mechanics and the work that you did. Um, were women coming in and more taking over more jobs that, uh, previously well, done by men? I think they started out being yeomen, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was about the first thing that opened up as far as I can remember, and there were some of them there. And then there was uh, one or two women that were hospital corpsmen, corps women, I guess, and uh, not much else except, uh, of course, our commanding officer was a woman. What was her rank? Oh boy, captain, I guess, captain? I don't know. I don't Good. Remember. Good for her. Irene Schreiber, yeah, she was, she had the gold braid. <laughs> Schreiber, this is of the Schreiber family, the uh, connected with the Kennedys? No, Schreiber. Schreiber. S C H R E I B E R. It's not Schreiber. No. Okay. No. Alrighty. Can you tell us about uh, your daily life there? Hot weather? 
uh, good weather? What was it like? Well, of course, in the summer it was pretty hot. In the winter it got surprisingly cold. You know, Pensacola is not, not down south of the southern part of Florida. It's up on the Panhandle. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's right next door to Alabama, is it? Yeah. And um, it got cold in the winter time. We had to wear a heavy coat over our uniform. And uh, well, I don't know. It's just our r daily routine was the same, you know, all the time. And then when we got leave, you know, you weren't working every day. You got a day or two off. You go to to go into Pensacola, and there they had, you know, movie theaters like a regular town. It's a regular town, and uh, a lot of Navy in there, and civilians in the Navy didn't like each other very well. <laughs> town and gown, that kind of thing. The men called them sand crabs. Sand crabs. <laughs> the other ladies, yeah. Did you get to see any more? Did you travel further afield in Pensacola? No. Did you get to go home from there? Yeah, you get every six months. Well, you were in the service, you know, <laughs> weren't you? Yeah, but I didn't go home every six months. Where were you? In the South Pacific. Oh, well, you know, you didn't. Uh, every six months you're due to leave, you know, six, two weeks. Yeah. And you were promoted, as you said, to second class, yeah. that's great. Do you feel that the, your officership was good, that the people responsible for you took good care of you, your officers? Yeah. Were your clothes adequate for where you were, food good, that kind of thing? Well, the food wasn't that great. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I wasn't, I, I could eat it, but some of them didn't like it. And uh, as what was the other thing you said, clothes? Clothes, yeah. Oh, We're, well, you know, you got your uniform. You talk of wearing a coat before. Yeah. Well, we wore slacks to work in and a shirt in the summertime, just a shirt and slacks. And, of course, you always wear your hat. <laughs> You're up to 1944 now. And uh, did you stay at Pensacola? or uh, Actually, I married. In 44, did you marry a serviceman? Someone from the base or someone you had met? Yeah. They, his squadron moved down there to the other end of our field. Being a new field, they had our squadron there first, but then there was still space and they came down to the other end of the field. This was a pilot? No, he wasn't a pilot, no. Mm -hmm. He what, was a radio man. Can you tell us how you met? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't care about talking about that. Okay, sorry. And you got married, and did that mean that you were going to leave the service? You didn't have to, no. But uh, I became pregnant, that's why I left. Okay, so... Now, nowadays you wouldn't have to leave, but you did then. And you were discharged from the United States Navy in 1944. November, yeah. November 44. And where, do you go home to uh, Kentucky or did you go home to where? <laughs> <laughs> well, my husband and I lived in Pensacola for a while. And then when he went overseas, I went home to my, went to home to Kentucky. And waited for him to come back home, or at least till the war yeah. ended. Yeah. He was from Wellesley. That's how come I'm up here. Was that your then your first trip into Massachusetts? Uh, well, after up? we got married, we, we came up here. And we were both in the Navy then. It was, uh, you know, after he got home, that, that was my first time to live in Massachusetts. Yeah. How did you get over here to Natick then, <laughs> a few miles away? Well, we bought a house in Saxonville. Mm -hmm. We lived there 10 years, about. And then uh, we bought a house in Natick in 
57, and that's where we lived. And that's the house you're still living in? Yeah, I still live in it. Oh, from Virginia Road. Was there, in the time that you were in the Navy and in wartime America, was there a most memorable experience in your career that you could tell us about? Oh, I don't know. You know, the men have all those war stories to tell, but <laughs> we weren't in combat. No, but you left home as a pretty young woman. Yeah. You went into what was the great unknown of the war in other yeah. parts of the country. Yeah. Uh, I think this is a very brave thing to do, too. Well. Is there something that stands out that you, when you look back on your Navy life, that you think of a particular moment or experience? Well, I suppose you'd say meeting my husband and getting married was about the big thing, but as far as my work in the Navy, you know, it was, it was pretty interesting to do what I did, I thought, train those cadets because, you know, they were going to be officers when they got out. They were commissioned ensigns, and here I, we were just petty officers, and we were teaching them. Did you have a sense of uh, responsibility and concern for their training, that you were part of it, that you knew a lot was riding on what you taught them? Yeah, we knew that. And uh, we, we really tried hard with them because we knew they had to pass that to be pilots. And uh, pilots were very much in demand at that time. <laughs> You know? Absolutely. The, the Navy was expanding as it never had before. Is there um, a character, a person other than your husband, <laughs> that you can tell us about that you remember from your time in the Navy? Well, I had the person who mostly taught me my job, Lent Training, was she was very good to me, very helped me learn it, you know, in there in, in Atlanta. I guess, you know, I could have not, not been able to learn all that stuff. <laughs> but they had women who were very good teachers, I think. She was. And uh, if I didn't get something right, why, well, she would uh, tell me, help me get it. And like I said before, we were supposed to learn Morse code, but I, I couldn't get that. I couldn't do it. But she didn't have anything to do with that. That was a different instructor. But uh, they let me get my, they let me graduate without having known that, without being able to do that, which was pretty, pretty good. You know, they could have not let me get out of there. To your knowledge, did anybody who learned the code well did they ever use it after that? Only thing I know that they ever used was A and N. They gave that signal, A and N, mm -hmm. to locate yourself on a beam from a radio station. And uh, as far as I know, that's all they ever used. <laughs> so you only had to learn one or two letters. <laughs> they knew that we didn't have to know all of that. I yeah. guess that's why they let me graduate. I don't know if there was anybody else that uh, didn't learn it or not, but uh, I just couldn't. I just couldn't get that hang of that. <laughs> but we really didn't need it. Like you know how the Navy, how the service was. They teach you a lot of stuff. Some of it you don't need, and uh, some of it you do. But if you get the essential thing, I think that's all that's necessary. Was there a humorous experience that you recall? <laughs> something that funny that happened. I don't know. I tried to think of something funny. <laughs> well, there was one of those cadets that he was, he didn't think he could learn that. You know, he was just ready to quit. Uh, we kind of encouraged him to go on and he learned it all right. But I don't know if that was funny. 
In what way did you encourage him uh, or well, keep him we, from being discouraged? We didn't give him any extra time because they were on a schedule. They had to be somewhere every hour mm. of the day. But uh, I think they would let them take some one phase of it over, you know. If they didn't get it the first time, they could take it the sec do a second trip on that one. Because every hour, each time, they were supposed to learn a certain thing. And uh, I know they let them, gave them another chance to learn it. That's good. They like needed another hour of training. When and where uh, were you discharged, Virginia? In Pensacola. At Pensacola. And uh, with what rank now? Same rank I had, second class petty officer. Did you join uh, any reserve unit when you came home? No, you no. were you were now a mother, right? Or about to be, and yeah. you had other things to do. Did you join any uh, groups like veterans organizations like the American Legion? I did join the American Legion in Worcester for one year. Yeah. Are you still a member of that? No. no. Um, let's see. The war ended, you were home. Um, how about your family? Did you get to see them? You were there in Kentucky and you were in Wellesley. Or, or well, I stayed with them until you know. he came home. And then, uh, yeah, I would go back there every so often. Yeah. And your mom and dad are gone now, and oh, your yeah. brother is gone oh, too, yeah. I understand. What did he do in the Navy? What did he do? Yeah. I don't know, he was just a seaman. He didn't, uh, <clears throat> he didn't get very, he didn't stay in very long, actually. He didn't join until late, late in the war. And uh, I don't know. He didn't take any training. He didn't have any go to school or anything. I don't know. He was just a seaman. How important to you was serving in the military? What? How important to you in your life uh, was serving in the military? Well, it was it was really important. I thought you know I did something important, and then I went on the GI Bill and finished college. Good for you. Up to Framingham yeah. Yeah. State. So that gave me that. Of course, we didn't know when we enlisted that there was a GI, there wasn't any GI Bill then. No, that came afterwards. Oh yeah. yeah, so we didn't enlist for that reason. But it, uh, we could do it. In the long run, do you feel that uh, serving in the military, other than getting a college education, but th that it affected your life? Yeah. Yeah, well, I learned, I learned uh, no discipline. I think that was a pretty good thing. Uh, and uh, I felt like I was a part of the, what was going on, that I helped. You know, mm -hmm. I did my part. And uh, yeah, it was important to me, yeah. What did you think then, and what did you, th what do you think now, about the war that you were involved in? Well, well, I think that was uh, probably the most important war that America was ever in, and uh, what was the question? I was, the question specifically is, what did you think then, when you were 21 years old, yeah. in, about the conflict that you were getting into? And now looking back on it, 50 some years, what do you think about it now? Are your feelings about the same? The worthwhileness of the cause? Well, we had to, you know. We didn't have much choice in that war, did we? We had to. We had to win that war, and that that fighting on two fronts was pretty. It was a lot. I thought it was. 
As far as war, I don't like war, but uh, if you get into it, or if you have to do it, well, you, you have to do it. These things, these wars since, since the World War II, I don't think have been so important as that was. That's, uh, you were anticipating uh, my next question. Do you feel there's a difference in public opinion regarding the war and the veterans uh, of the war you served in and those who came along in, say, uh, Korea or Vietnam? Well, we got a lot of recognition after we got out of the war. You know, the veterans were treated well after World War II, and everybody wanted to do everything for us. But I think after Vietnam and Korea, I think that those wars, well, everybody knows they weren't as popular, and the veterans weren't treated as well afterwards. They should have been, because they risked their lives just the same, but, uh, mm. well, you know, public opinion wasn't with Vietnam. I mean, we were pretty much divided in this country on Vietnam, I think, and they were not treated, I don't feel they were treated very well after it was over. Yes, that's quite true. You spoke of uh, taking advantage of the, the GI Bill. Are there any other benefits, uh, veterans' benefits, that uh, have been good for you in your life? Uh, a house or insurance or hospitalization or anything like that? Well, right now I'm getting a disability from the Veterans Administration or whatever, Veterans Affairs. It wasn't service connected either, and I wouldn't have gotten it if I hadn't gone down to and talked to. I didn't go to talk about that. I went down to Mr. McGilvery, you know, mm -hmm. and he said, "Well, you could get a disability because I, my knee and my back were, I was disabled kind of, but it wasn't service connected, and I didn't think about applying for it. And so be the, he had the papers there, and he helped me fill them out, you know, and sent them in, and I got a disability." Well, good, for you. Me. good for you. Good for you. Virginia, is there one thought or one incident or one thing that you would like to tell us about before we end this tape to share with people who will look at this tape uh, a long time from now <laughs> about serving in the military of the United States? Well, I don't know who's going to look at it. <laughs> but. Uh, I wouldn't know what to tell them either. I was, um, I was proud of my service, and I would recommend it to anybody who thinks they would like to do it. I think that there is a place for a lot of people in the military to do different things. But don't, don't, don't enlist just for something to do, you know. If you don't know that you want to do it, don't do it. <laughs> Is there anything that we haven't asked you today that you would like to comment on about your service in the military? Uh, I think this is all going to show up, isn't it? Uh, no, I think you've asked quite a bit. <laughs> all right. Some of which I didn't know the answers to. <laughs> <laughs> you did very well. We thank you very All much right, for coming you. in today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have had you here. You too.